In continuation of our studies looking at where international humanitarian law actually applies, we're going to focus in this lesson and in the next lesson on the concept of belligerent occupation. Now, what is important is we've looked at belligerent occupation already, or at least mentioned it briefly in previous lessons, because it's a very important aspect of international humanitarian law that sort of tangentially relates to the concept of international armed conflicts, since one of the requirements for belligerent occupation is this idea of a conflict that is international in character. So what we're going to do in this lesson and what we're going to do in the next lesson is talk about the concept of belligerent occupation in far more detail, talk about what is required for the existence of belligerent occupation, and also what is required for the ending of a belligerent occupation as well. So according to Common Article 2.2 of the Geneva Conventions, when we look at the application of international humanitarian law to an international armed conflict, these rules that exist that we've looked at previously will also apply to quote all cases of partial or total occupation of the territory of a high contracting party even if the said occupation meets with no armed resistance so essentially what this does is it places the idea of belligerent occupation under the remit of the broader concept of international armed conflicts that's why we're covering the idea of belligerent occupations before for example going on to looking at non-international armed conflicts because this is essentially another type of international armed conflict this is even the case if there is no resistance to the belligerent occupation in question which is seen in the second line here from common article 2. so what is involved and what is required as a proof to show belligerent occupation taking place and you might think that this is a relatively menial question but it is important because essentially what it is requiring us to do is look at where international humanitarian law applies and so if we are going to make the argument that it will apply in situations and circumstances of belligerent occupation, which of course it does, then we have to know precisely what belligerent occupation actually is, what is required to show and establish that belligerent occupation is taking place. Now, the first of these things is, of course, the idea of one state inv invading another state. So the first uh, precondition for the existence of a belligerent occupation is the existence of an international armed conflict it is the invasion of one state um, by another the second element is of course the establishment of control over either all of the territory that has been invaded or maybe part of that territory so there is the two conditions that we have here you can be in control of only part of the territory or maybe total occupation uh, e either or in this in this example now, continuing on then, Article 42 of the Hague Regulations makes it uh, very clear that territory is considered to be occupied when it is actually placed under the authority of the hostile army. The occupation extends only to the territory where such authority has been established and can be exercised. This is a very important passage because what this does is it gives us the requirement that takes us from not just an invasion or not just an international armed conflict, but then it also takes us logically to the next of these things, which is the idea of the occupation itself. It is considered to be occupied when it is actually placed under the authority of the hostile army. So... What are we going to be focusing on here? Well, we're talking about the establishment of actual authority. What do we need to establish actual authority? And some of the language that is used in the literature and in some cases in, in some regards is this idea of the establishment of effective control. Now, just like with issues that we talk about relating to the scope of application of international humanitarian law, specifically to the broader subject of international armed conflicts, most of the questions that we ask when we were relating to the idea of belligerent occupation and most of the determinations that we make in relation to belligerent occupation taking place are questions of fact. So they are questions that are objective. They are based on the factual nature of what is going on or in the field or on the ground or on the battlefield or in the country in question. And so therefore, when we are talking about making a determination of belligerent occupation, we have to first uh, establish that there is an international armed conflict. OK, that shouldn't be too difficult to do, given the fact that we have examined those issues in previous lessons. And then we have to show that the invading state is 
and has established effective control over either part of the territory or maybe the entirety of the territory. And to do that, we're, of course, asking a factual question. Does this state have effective control? So that is the issue that we have to examine. And Article 42 of the Hague Regulations makes it very, very clear that this idea of actual control or effective control, as I've cited here, over the territory is a prerequisite for the applicability of the rules relating to the law of occupation. If we go back to the Article 42 specifically, it is essentially a requirement for a territory to be considered occupied that it is placed under the actual authority of the hostile army. So this raises an interesting question. We note that, generally speaking, the template for a belligerent occupation is firstly an international armed conflict, secondly an invasion of one territory by another territory, and thirdly the effective control of that territory, whether it be the entirety of the territory or whether it be uh, an aspect of that territory. So let's think about the second part of that list. We have the idea of the invasion of one state by another state. So do we constitute that the invasion phase of the occupation is uh, uh, akin to the, pop uh, the occupation itself? Do the rules and laws of occupation apply during the invasion phase? The next question is, when is it said that the invasion phase has officially ended and the occupation phase has officially begun? All of these are questions that we have to ask, because essentially what Article 42 of the Hague Regulations does is it makes a delineation between this first phase, this invasion phase, and the occupation phase, such that the state cannot be considered to be occupied while being invaded by the other state. And so in actuality, it is the case that the invasion is followed by the establishment of effective control that creates a state of, uh, of belligerent occupation. So it is not just the invasion of a state, but it is the invasion of the state and then the maintenance of effective control for a duration of time, for a particular period of time. Now, this is what Article 42 of the Hague Regulations makes very clear, but the Fourth Geneva Convention is less clear in uh, making a case for whether or not this invasion phase constitutes an occupation and therefore will constitute the application of the law of occupation. So Article 4 of the Fourth Geneva Convention um, makes it very clear that the common understanding is that protection is extended to all individuals who at a given moment and in any manner whatsoever find themselves in case of conflict or occupation in the hands of a party to the conflict or occupying power of which they are not nationals. So what the Fourth Geneva Convention is suggesting or at least implying, is that there is a little bit more nuance and there's a little bit more of a fluid definition given to the idea of occupation in the sense that it could include this invasion phase uh, as, soon as, as soon as an individual finds themselves in the case of a conflict or occupation in the hands of a party to the conflict. Now, this can take place before the official end of this invasion phase, while the invasion is taking place, while more and more territory is being gained by the invading uh, state, then that could constitute the fact that there is a growing amount of occupation as the invasion continues, if that makes sense. Now, what this would imply is that the summer of the protections that may be applicable to individuals um, may be even applicable before effective control has been established in this invasion phase of the occupation process. So these are questions that we have to ask, and these are questions that don't necessarily have a clear-cut answer when we talk about the uh, application of occupation law. Because essentially, in this example and in this instance, we're focusing on a classic template case for how occupation exists and what happens with occupation. In the actual real world, occupation and belligerent occupation doesn't tend to fit these nice, neat boxes um, necessarily in the kind of way that we've got here. So there are examples of occupations that have existed for many, many years, many, many decades. And so therefore, we have to ask the question, of um, the application of the law in this uh, particular example or in any of the examples that we have got. Now, the next lesson is going to focus on another very important element of the uh, law of belligerent occupation, which is the 
ending of a belligerent occupation? What are the factors and what are the requirements for ending a belligerent occupation? 